Hi, this is the fellow passenger speaking. Yesterday, I made this video recording, but I forgot to record my voice or I did record my voice without actually arming the recording. So I may talk a little bit about what I'm doing on the screen, but also lots of other rubbish at the same time. I will be making a complete track. There will also be a free giveaway of the full track and I've put a link in the description if you want to take a little sneak peek. If you become a Patreon though, you will get access to this project file. I'm using Ableton 11 Suite. So if you've got that or a newer one, you should be fine. I'm just using Ableton native stuff and some Max for Live stuff, including some that I have made and used in previous videos. But if you become a new patron, you will be able to access those as well and enjoy them. This is going to be a little bit of an operator fest. I think, if I remember correctly from what I did yesterday, I'm using Operator for all the sound creation. Not using any pre-made samples apart from one that I'm grabbing off the internet somewhere at some point during this video. What we see here? It's obviously me making a kick. Uh, we just went past it, but changing the face of a sine wave so it doesn't start at this zero point, but it starts either at the top or at the bottom of the curve. It starts off with more of a click, which can be helpful when you're making a kick drum. You get some more transients in there. And another thing, which I'm probably not doing enough in this video, but I've started to do more just to get slightly cleaner mixes. Trying to scoop out frequencies that I don't think are necessary for the sound. There's quite often frequencies in sounds that are not necessarily that audible, but they are in there. And if you add lots more of other sounds in your track, it will all build up and create a stack. So, yeah, this video is about an hour and a half long and I'm making an entire track. And it's something that quite a few people have asked me about and certainly something that I have been up against a lot, that thing of finishing music. I think the biggest difference for me is to just have a little bit of a structure. You can deviate from that when you get comfortable with working with a structure. I think it almost doesn't matter what that structure is, but if you have a bit of a process to it. So for example, here, I start off doing some sound design, creating a, an interesting palette of sounds that inspires me, I do that first, and then I start to compose, and then I arrange, and then I probably do a little bit of stuff on the master channel, which one should never do, but I do it anyway. You can do those things in any order you want, but otherwise, if I don't try to follow some form of process, I often end up noodling forever and end up with a four bar loop or something and it doesn't become anything more than that. It's still a very good practice for me just to finish music a bit sort of warts and all. You don't really need to um, be too precious about what you're making. Okay, we're getting to the snare bit. I find snare sounds tricky to make them feel satisfying. It's not hard to make something that sounds like a snare, but a snare that inspires me is not that easy. Another thing that I keep 
getting back to or thinking about is like when I'm using Ableton. I'm going to be quiet for a moment because it's just going to be noisy for a while. saying there are two main ways I make hi-hats. Either I use noise or I have detuned square waves, which tend to create more of a metallic sound. And yeah, it's just different flavors. I believe that's how the TR-606 is making its hi-hats, for example, and probably the 909 too. I don't know. So I was going to say the thing in operator, the, the variable that says fixed, which allows you to uh, fix like I'm doing here. I'm fixing it to a particular frequency rather than it tracking with the keyboard. It, it's a functionality that I've known about for years, but tend to forget about using. It's there in plain sight, but... Um, yeah, I've sort of forgotten about it, but it's really powerful to create interesting detuned sounds. And also sometimes if you mix it up a bit that some of the oscillators are fixed and some are not, you can get some really nice dissonant things and that works quite nicely for percussive sounds. And that's the thing that keeps happening in Ableton. I see these things that I know what they do and they're there in plain sight, but I also tend to forget about them. And then when I discover them, sometimes I realize I can use them in a different context that I haven't done before. So it feels almost like a never ending journey. At the same time, I keep coming back to the Ableton stock plugins. Most of them are very good. But recently I have started looking elsewhere as well. There's some uh, third party premium plugins that I keep coming back to because I think they are genuinely more powerful in a way than the ones that come with Ableton. For example, the FabFilter Q3 plugin, which I think is far superior in terms of ease of use compared to the... Let's just wait for that hi-hat to calm down a bit. Is it calm down now or is it still... We're not having it just yet. I, I think it just has features in there that makes live for mixing a lot easier. The other one is Gulfos Master, which is a fantastic plugin to put at the end of your mastering chain. It's based on artificial intelligence and it's working live and it's not just a fixed setting for the entire track. It will change as the track is playing. And it's really good at carving out um, horrible frequencies. Then I've also invested in the FM8, which is by Native Instruments, which is a fantastic FM synth. I picked it up when it was on a special offer on um, Plugin Boutique. Is that what it's called? Yes, it's called Plugin Boutique, isn't it? The other one is the Arturia Mini Freak software version. I used to have the Micro Freak hardware synth, and in many ways it's great. It was so easy to get an interesting sound very quickly. It just didn't take long at all. I had a few things I didn't like about it. One was the uh, the lack of a dedicated decay 
in the envelope. It was just a three stage where the decay and release shared the same, same parameter. And I often like to uh, modulate just the decay and use the, the release independently. That's been solved with the mini freak. Um, so that's fine now. The other thing that I thought about the Arturia Microfeek, even though the sounds were good, they sounded very much like a, a software plugin to me. And I rarely reached for the hardware unit anyway. It was sitting in my rack and I would control it with a Max for Live device instead. So it made sense for me to sell the Microfreak, save some space, save some money, and buy the Mini Freak while it was still on offer. And as I'd bought some other Arturia stuff, I got even more of a discount. I think I paid £69 for it and sold the Microfreak for £235. So that felt like quite a good deal to me. Then there are some other plugins, for example, like the um, the reverbs made by... Gosh, I can't think of what they're called now. I just have to take a little look. The Valhalla ones. And especially the Valhalla Vintage Verb is one that I keep coming back to. I think it sounds more pleasant to my ears compared to the, to the one that comes in Ableton. I feel like I can get a sound that I like much quicker with that. Another one that I use mainly for my voice is Klevgrand Bruce Free. Saying that with a Swedish accent, Klevgrand, I assume, is the surname of the person developing them. Bruce Free means noise free in Swedish, and it works really well just to remove ambient noise, and especially now when I'm doing voice recordings. I have some other third-party plugins as well, but I, yeah, mainly free ones. Some of them are featured in my videos, but I try to mainly stick to the Ableton stock ones when I'm making these videos just to make it easy, especially for my Patreons to be able to grab the files and open them and, without having to go and purchase third-party plugins. It would be good to hear your thoughts on that if you want me to start using other plugins. I probably do occasionally anyway, but if you have any particular opinion about it, it would be good to hear. So let's get back to what is happening in the video. I'm setting up a track for each. At the moment, we got the kick, the snare, hi-hat, and then we got some random percussive instruments. I'm using some probability just to create variation in the beats. The other thing I'm doing, I've got a fairly high BPM of 177 just to create, I suppose, a higher resolution. I mean, in a way, I could probably set the the, uh, the grid to 32s rather than 16th notes, but it somehow helps me when I'm making these sort of beats to get them to stumble a little bit easier, which I think sounds interesting. I don't know if that makes sense. Oh, and what I'm doing here, is what I explained in a recent video, I'm doing some frequency splitting. So I've taken the entire group of beats and I split the frequency up in uh, different bands, which means that I can process the bass, the mids and the highs independently. So if you want a slightly more in depth on that, check out the video that I released. Um, not that long ago. Was it my most recent one? I sh should probably start killing my darlings like this one. But I still love it to 
have some sine folding on the bass frequencies. It just creates some really satisfying upper harmonics for bass and, and uh, beats. I'm using the kick a lot in this track to trigger my expression control, but to trigger things in other aspects of the track. So for example, here I'm uh, adjusting the bias control. Is that what it's called? The bass bias control in, uh, for the bass frequencies. So I'm using the kick to control something that happens on group level. Reverb is tricky. I often find it difficult to balance them right. Um, slightly easier with the Valhalla vintage verb, I find anyway. But if you think about the purpose of reverb, I mean, one way of seeing it is that you move sounds further back in the mix. It's almost creating that feeling of bokeh or slightly out of focus when you're taking a photograph. It's also uh, an interesting method for um, putting something further back. No, sorry, not further back in the mix, but you can add a tail to something that doesn't necessarily have a tail. And when you compress it afterwards, it sort of glues the sounds together. And another way of doing this is not to use a delay, but you can use the vocoder, for example, in Ableton, which adds a tail of noise. Whenever there is a signal coming in, it modulates it with noise and you can add a release to that. And I think more recently I've found that sounds quite interesting. And I know that sooner or later in this track, I am going to play around with the return channels. And rather than having a return channel with a, a, a reverb in it, I'm going to use the vocoder. What we can see here is that I'm adding some effects to the different frequency bands and especially I find that the lower frequencies often work better when they're in mono or sit in the middle of the mix, whereas the higher up you go or the more contextual the sound is rather than the hero, you can push that further out to the side and those sounds can also be much more random. I think you can have random elements in all the frequency bands and also in the, what should we call them, the, the sort of main sound, the lead melody or the, the main beat or whatever. But you need some form of continuity there. I, I like that anyway for your brain to latch on to. Sometimes you can have it slide out of control and then it's interesting to bring it back into control again to allow your brain to hold on to something because otherwise it just becomes too much like just noise. I would also like to talk a bit about the hardware. I have a fair bit of hardware, but there are always issues somewhere in that realm that stops me from being as effective as I want to be. I'm not saying I'm not using the hardware because I do that loads and I probably should do more videos about it. Well, I know that I do, I will make more videos about it. I spent quite a few days recently to rewire the entire studio. But one thing, really annoying thing happened the other day. I've got these Scarlett 18 in 20 
what is it called? 20i, 18i20. It's got eight analog inputs for plugging hardware and effects in or whatever you have. And then I expanded that with a Behringer, is it ADA 8200? Is that what it's called? Um, it, it allows you to expand your audio interface using an ADAT cable. So I get another eight inputs, which I needed. But ADAT, like, Maybe the thing I hate most about ADAT is the actual sockets. Why do they make them so damn fragile? One had already broken on my sound card. It's got a, like a little door that when you push the cable there in, the door sort of opens and I suppose lets the light out or in for that matter. That is just made out of the thinnest, weakest construction imaginable. The one that's fallen off my audio interface is not necessarily the one that I need, so that was okay. But it is the one that I need on my, my Behringer. And when that fell off, I had to gaffer tape the cable onto the unit just to keep it in place because also that door is, I don't know if it's the door itself, but it just doesn't hold the cable in place since that door has fallen off. So I had to gaffer tape it to there and any little nudge on my rack would displace that slightly and all of a sudden it stopped clicking and popping because it's an intermittent connection and eventually there would be no connection at all. And the other day, I just reached a point where that was so annoying and there was more often no signal at all than that there was a signal. Maybe it's just gotten worse over time, so I've disconnected it. I need to solve this. And I'm feeling that ADAT may not be the way forward. But I have to think financially as well, because at the moment I don't have a permanent job. I need to get one, but I also want to make the music thing work. So how do I spend my money wisely? I've been looking at this ESI unit, which is another audio interface with 16, 16 inputs. It looks very impressive. It looks like it's rack size, but it doesn't look like it's got rack ears, so I'm not sure I'll be able to mount it in my rack, but I'm still tempted by it. The other thing is that it does not have a DAT. So how I would need to use it is to use it as an aggregate device with my existing Focusrite, which sounds really tempting. I'm already using aggregate devices because I got the sound card in my Eurorack as well, which is great. But I also hear all these horror stories how aggregate devices causes all sorts of issues. And the ESI device does not have ADAT, so I cannot fall back on that. The other thing is that I can repair the Behringer, but ooh, I don't know. need to contemplate. The other thing is that there are a few other things I would like. I should stop buying hardware really, but there are a few things that I like. I have had my eyes on the Yamaha TX7, which is the desktop version of the Yamaha DX7 Mark One, And I think the Mark I sounds better because it's actually sounding less pristine than the later ones. I suppose it's a bit noisier. And I would use software to program it anyway. And it's far cheaper than the, um, than the real DX7 or real. I mean, the other one is real as well, but it's, it's, it's not the keyboard version. And I would probably use Dext to program it. I'll need to look into it because I think you can do it sort of live, live manipulated it rather than just setting up a patch and then sending it to the TX. 
I suppose it's much, much cheaper because you cannot program it or not fully anyway on, on the unit itself. And it's not something I would look at doing anyway. On that note, I found a very cheap Yamaha TX81Z, which is the rack version of the Yamaha DX100, which is a classic. It's only got four operators compared to the six that you get on the DX7, but it allows you to use other waveforms than just sine waves, and the waveforms that are in the TX81Z are weird. They are not your usual ones. I'll bring some up on the screen for you to see. And it sounds really great. I want to do a video on it. I also want to do some more experiments using controlling it by software. I have programmed it using the little display and I think that was possibly possible entirely based on my experience with the texts and the quirks with the envelopes especially yeah the, the amp envelope and the pitch envelope because to me they act in a way that is slightly more unusual well not like most other synths and just because i know those little quirks it was not impossible to do it on the display even though it was i wouldn't describe it as a joy i would rather just modulate the hell out of it using max for live devices i also acquired an old effects unit made by art and it's called the multiverb alpha 2.0 I knew the battery was dead when I bought it because the seller had said so. I tried the unit and it sounded amazing. Not natural in any way. So I replaced the battery and now something has gone wrong with the unit. So I need to get it repaired. The unit has got a little bit of story. Whether it's true or not, I don't know. It doesn't really matter so much because the unit sounds amazing, but apparently it's the very unit, not the same model, but the actual unit that Dave Clark used for Red 2, which is Wisdom of Wisdom to the Wise. So you're into some old school proper techno. That is such a track. I'll put a link in the description if you want to hear it. I wouldn't say there's anything sophisticated about it. It's just old school and satisfying in that sense. So if it is true that that very unit is the one that I used for the effects for it, I just can't wait to get it working and using it. I would also like to mention the model cycles, which is... Uh, fairly low cost unit made by Electron. I've had it for a while, but I'm probably apart, about to put that up for sale. The same complaint I have for that one, just as with the, the um, Micro Freak. It sounds really good, but it also sounds like software. And when I'm going to say this in Swedish again, Fosh, I think that's probably what it's called. The software company where the guy who did the software for the model cycle, he's working and he has made this Max for Live device, which is called Opal. It's not the same as the motorcycle, but it feels like they have certain things in common. And I'm quite frankly rather use that than the model cycles. And why not then save some money, say, sell the unit, save up some space and just do that. So it's not up for sale yet, but it will be. Another piece of gear that I'm selling is the original base station, the keyboard version. I had that up for sale for a bit, but decided to take it down because I think there is an issue with it, which is the, um, uh, what are they called? The octave buttons, so you can pitch the keyboard up and down. Um, 
I do not think they are working, but I want to test that properly. So when I put it up for sale, I just want to be super open about it. It's not a massive issue because if you are, you got a control keyboard or you're controlling it from Ableton or something, you can still access all the notes. It's just the keyboard itself. Maybe the buttons just need some contact cleaner, but I'm going to check it out. I remember when the original base station came out, it was at the time when synths with buttons and sliders, uh, sorry, with sliders and knobs, basically analog synths, were not that easy to get hold of. There were just not new ones coming on the market in the same way. So when that one came out, everyone talked about it as like, wow, it's almost like having a TB303. And it was basically like, to have a cut off and resonance to play with, it was just like, wow, it was just a thing. And someone I knew at the time at school bought one and he needed to, there was some point when he needed to borrow 500 Swedish Krona, I suppose about 50 quid. And in return, a friend, yeah, a friend did that, another friend did that, and in return, he got to borrow the base station, and we decided, like, let's form a band. Like, that was the only thing we had. We didn't really have anything to record onto. We sequenced it through the Amiga because I had a MIDI interface for it, and we probably recorded it onto cassette or something, but we didn't have a mixer or anything. And it was just probably my first proper experience of... No, it wouldn't have been the first because we did have a Juno 106 at school to sort of, I don't know, in the music room. I didn't realize how cool it was then. But now in hindsight, I don't think the base station should be regarded as a TB303 clone. Clone. It's got two oscillators. Uh, it just, it's just different. And I think with the TB303, TB it's the sequencer that makes more of a difference rather than the oscillators, etc. If you want that acid sound. And I bought my own base station much, much later. When I lived in Australia, I can't remember exactly what year I bought it, maybe 2009 or something. I got it for little money. And it was a bit like a trip down memory lane, buying it, remembering having used it there in the 90s. And I don't know, I, I, I'm going to sell it. It is a real and by today's standards, a vintage analog synthesizer. But I don't think its sound is that much for me. I think my SH-101 do those sounds that I want much better. Yes, it doesn't have two oscillators and yeah, it can certainly, the, yes, the base station can certainly do things that my SH-101 can't. But it's just not a piece of equipment that I'm reaching for. So that's why the base station will have to, will have to go. So the microfeed is gone, model cycles is probably going, the base station is definitely going. I am sort of longing for a TX7 when it comes out, well, when one is advertised for the right price. Uh, the other thing that I want, I need to sort out my sound audio interface situation. Then I need to get a three-head cassette unit. That might surprise you if you watched my most recent video where I'm using one as a tape delay. That one belongs to my partner. But I realized that I need one permanently in the studio because that one I've given back now. I need one permanently in the studio for several reasons. Like one is that the different flavors of tape delay 
that it gives you. I got a Roland Space Echo, which sounds amazing, don't get me wrong. But the flavor is different. And also you can change the flavor of this tape echo in a much easier way because you can just swap the cassette out to a different type of cassette. The other thing is that because you can do the monitoring off the tape, that you can just literally use it as a tape saturation tool without uh, having to record your entire mix onto a tape and then record it back in again. You just like use that as a sort of send return effect and you just send your entire mix onto it and just get it with the tape, tape, the tape sound. I have been looking at this unit online, which is not too expensive, which has also got a tape speed or like a motor speed knob, which will create additional interest to when you use it as a tape echo. I would also argue that old electronics makes more of a difference to your sound than analog oscillate like i think often people think oh i want to get vintage synths to get that vintage sound but i've realized that you don't necessarily need that so i got an old mackie mixer the uh, is it called 1604 not the vlz model i think that's important if I just make some sounds using Ableton, which sounds very computery and very pristine, and I run them through the run them through the mixer, it just adds some mojo to it. I think it's because the sound is imperfect, and especially if I put a little bit of compression on after, because that highlights the imperfections. And I've also noticed that with old digital synths, that they sound good too. It's Someone was saying it's because of the analog to digital converters that makes that difference. That may be true, but it's just the same. Like if you take that old cassette tape and just blend that cassette saturation in a little bit with pristine sounds from Ableton, you get loads of character. And I think that is maybe the cheap way into vintage sounds rather than aiming well you shouldn't stop aiming for buying old vintage synths if you want them because they do sound great but there are other ways into vintage sounds that you can take that i think sounds both more interesting and organic than plugins that does that, that some of those plugins sound good but rather than having a plugin that emulates tape saturation I can buy a tape unit that is probably sometimes cheaper than the plugin itself but it is the real deal so that might be worth considering I've been talking too much, haven't I? I should probably just have some more pauses so we can focus on what's happening in the track. I am using the Phrygian dominate, dominant scale here, which is actually a scale that I've started using more and more recently. The reason for that is the tension that semitone changes make. So if you have two notes just right next to each other, the, uh, depending on what flavor you want to get in your track, but the dissonance with notes right next to one another is sometimes really appealing. So that's why I grabbed that scale. As you can see, the C and the C sharp are both in the scale, as an example, or the G and G sharp, and the E and the F. And it just creates a flavor with tension in it. So 
you can obviously just click through the scales if that's the flavor you are after to see what other scales have that uh, semitone shift. I've been playing around not on the, under the uh, fellow passenger moniker, but I've been playing around making some old school electro tunes and I've come to the conclusion that that semitone shift is often quite desirable in that context. And then I just decided to sort of implement it here. Otherwise, the minor pentatonic scale in D sharp, basically the black keys, is one that I have been using a lot. It sounds great, don't get me wrong, but it doesn't quite have those semitone well it doesn't have those semitone steps in there but it's uh, a minor scale so it still doesn't sort of do a happy melody but if you want more tension you need more dissonance i watched this talk about music for horror films and that is a deliberate choice for horror film scores to use dissonance because it is unsettling to us humans here is a little trick that i keep using so i've taken you saw before when i had the uh, track edit view up that i had set set it to Phrygian dominant scale, but here I, I've added it in as a MIDI plugin instead and chosen that scale. And before it, I am using a MIDI random plugin. And what that allows you to do, you compose a melody that you like. And as that melody progresses, if there's certain parts of the track, you can infuse it with random notes by dialing that up you set the likelihood of a different note to play rather than the one that you have chosen. So you can do that. Do you have the melody continuously playing, but then you gradually start introducing random notes into it. But just because you've got the right scale in place, it's not going to sound out of tune. It's not going to pick notes that are outside that scale. Ah, here we're seeing me using the vocoder as a sort of sort of reverb or sort of adding a bit of a tail. It's got quite a long tail anyway. adding the Redux plugin because it just adds some brittle upper harmonics to it, makes the sound a bit sort of more hollow. Actually looking at this now, I think I should have put the vocoder. No, maybe it's fine that it sits before the Redux, I wasn't sure. No, I think it's probably better that it sits before. The melody sounds whack here, but I think I do some stuff to it later that makes it sound better. The other thing here to add variation, as you can see, I got a bunch of chords in here, but I've set the chance to a little bit lower. So sometimes it plays the chord, sometimes it plays individual notes from the chord. Trying to add the reverb after all might not be such a bad decision in the end. Did you guys see that video from 
Toman Synths, I think. I can't remember what the guy is called, but he's... I think the video is labeled something like uh, IDM has never been easier to make. And he's using the Udo 6, I think it's called, uh, and Ableton to create this IDM track. Well, he's already created it and then he just picks it apart and shows you how he's done it. It made me realize like how different my methods are to his. I think especially it struck me when it came to the, the plugins that he used to mess up the sound. I can't remember what that one is called now that he's using, but he's stepping through presets and recording them out and getting lots of glitches and stuff. It reminded me of Stutter Edit 2, which I also have. I bought it on a super cheap sale, which is great, great for creating glitches. I don't know how to justify this quite, because it's random in a way that I don't feel confident about. How should I put it? It feels like plugins like Stutter Edit does so much that is hidden away from me. Well, it probably isn't hidden away from me, but I haven't spent a huge amount of time getting my head around it. It sounds good, but I feel like when I use random implementations, that the, I feel I'm very much in control over what is random and how much is affected, how random it is. So even though I don't make the deliberate choice of what values are going to be spat out, but I feel like I've set it up. If I use something like Stutter Edit, I feel like I can take less proud pride in the end result. Maybe that's a foolish thing to say. But anyway, his, his track sounded decent, I guess. Apart from there was something about the beats, not that the beats themselves sounded wrong, but there was something about the dynamics. Maybe it was that the, the volume levels of the break beats were sort of inconsistent and it sounded like it was fluctuating in volume in a strange sort of way. I think you could probably just fix that by some compression or something just to push those quiet bits up a bit, just glue it together a bit more. But also, I guess, interesting to see that there are so many different ways of making something that you can call IDM. It would be interesting to hear what you thought about that guy's track. Certainly got way more views than I did. I feel like my channel has grown. It started growing in, in like November time or something. And I would like it to grow more and I've had so many lovely comments I think especially one I see if I can get it up on my phone so I can know I should be able to for me having people reached out and giving me this praise that I've had even if it's just like great work it's, I mean it's been such a confidence boost and it was something that I didn't really get in my general work life so if I could turn this into my job would be a realistic income giving thing without compromising what I do. That's important to me. I don't think I would change the music that I make because I wouldn't compromise and do something I don't like just because of the money. But it also makes me feel a bit guilty. It's quite self-indulgent sitting here making IDM music, which is arguably quite... Um, 
it's gratifying me, but how many people want to listen to it? But then when I get comments like this, it's going to read it word by word. Hello, I just subscribed and wanted to thank you for all your work. When I found about Ned Rush and your channel, then I felt a big motivation to continue my journey in IDM and Electronica. That's make, that makes my life easier because you are familiar with Aphex Twin and Autecker and therefore you're analyzing different methods to get the right sound. It's just great and makes me feel alive. And during the war, in brackets, I'm from Ukraine, music is one of the ways to get away from all terrible things and just keep doing what is really important to me. Apologies for a little sentimental message. Best regards. I'm not going to say this guy's name because I don't know if he wants me to, so I'll leave that out. But that my videos have made... This is someone who signed up to my Patreon, by the way. That it's actually affected someone in a positive way who is in such a place like Ukraine at the moment where there is a war feels big feels big so thank you very much for that comment and all everyone's comments like i don't want to understate the impact they have on me but yeah thank you so if there's any of you who are listening now and you feel like you're able to help in any way supporting my channel i can't tell you how much that would mean to me if you could sign up to my patreon buy some of my merch Go and support Point Source Arts, where I sell my album on Bandcamp. That's the label Point Source Arts. If you feel you can spare some change, please, please consider it. Um, I would like, really like to make this work. I realize it's going to take a bit of time. I know that I'm going to need to take some freelance work or something just to make sure that ends meet because I'm eating into my savings a bit. But, wow, that sounds a bit depressing too. Let's talk about something more fun. Playing live. I played live for the first time in years on Friday at the Tile Yard in London. A really interesting place that I had no idea was there. It's, it's like a hub for the music industry. Loads of interesting recording studios, bars, restaurants, uh, cafes. I believe Spitfire Audio has their offices there. The Arturia have offices there. Record labels, distributors, people who make merch. But mainly there's loads of musicians there. And they had a nice venue with a nice setup. And I played live at their um, EMOM, Electronic Music Open Mic Night. It's organized by a guy who goes under the name Riggs. Riggs. I'll put the link in the description. He's also one of my Patreons. You should check him out. It was the first open electronic music night he did and it went really well and I really love playing live. And there are more live things in the pipeline now, which I'm really looking forward to. And hopefully that will be another way of meeting new people. But if you are probably in the London area or you are north of London, Essex, Suffolk, I will probably try to play live there, around there. Hopefully some other places in the UK too, maybe even abroad, who knows. I thoroughly enjoyed it, but I had to travel light, so I just brought my laptop and some MIDI controllers, but pretty much kept my eye off the screen for most of the time. I also just found out that there's going to be something from my live set that will be available from tomorrow night through um, this account called, let me see because I've already forgotten what it's called, Homebrew Electronica Show. I'll put a link in the description to that as well. I have no idea what is going to be part of this broadcast, but I'll... Um, I'll put the link in the description and they said I'll be up tomorrow night. You can also hear me on the internet radio called Index. 
Club, where I have another set, which is sort of a live set as well, but it doesn't count in the same way because it's done here in my home studio rather than live on stage. And you have a bit more control and you can fix issues <laughs> in a more controlled manner than you can if you're live on stage. But I'm really proud of that mix and edit because it's based on my album that I released on Point Source Arts. Um, but there are differences to the tracks and there's some new material in there that you should check out. And also on that one, the Homebrew Electronica show that will be up tomorrow, there's also just brand new material because, long story anyway, I made brand new stuff for this damn live show that I did on Friday, but I don't regret it. That was in London at the tile yard. All right, I've gotten to the point obviously now when I'm going to try to make some sort of arrangement. So I played those um, loops that I'd made obviously with the uh, chance set to different levels and then just recorded it in uh, just to have bulk material to then stop making my track and then starting adding things in. There's going to be a bit further on in this video where I, I will basically cut it out because I'm going somewhere online grabbing some sounds or a sound that I will be using because I felt I needed some, what shall we call it, vocal material <laughs> I wanted to put in. That's the only sample that I'm using apart from the all the sounds that I'm making here with these operators. The operator is great synth, but it also isn't the, the only option when it comes to FM. And I think if you would have asked me a good few years ago, I would not have been the least interested in FM because I only associated that sound palette with very poor emulations of real sounds. But I think when FM come, becomes interesting is when you're not trying to emulate a piano or something, when you just let it be its own thing, because it's just full of madness. Oh yeah, and I'm also putting these things on the master channel. Slightly unusual that I did a sort of a mid-side thing with uh, the EQ8. Not that I am against that in any way, it's more that I just tend to forget about it. And I don't know how much difference that makes. I wouldn't use this video as uh, the best um, reference for how to do a super clean mix. Anyway, talking about that sound that I'm grabbing from the internet further down the line, I'm going to cut that bit out. Did I say that? I can't even remember anymore. I'm just going to see if there is a weird cut in this video. That's when I'm sort of going and doing that. And I think it's sort of playing some ads on YouTube and stuff like that, that I just don't want to be part of my video. I just don't know what implication that might have. And yes, it just wouldn't feel like the right thing to do. And also like I'm on the desktop of my computer and things. And I, yeah, just a bit of privacy, I suppose. So cutting that out. And again, I should probably just shut up, not talk so much. Actually, maybe I leave it at that. Just be wary of when the weird cut happens, that's intentional. You can listen and enjoy this without hearing my voice. But just remember, check out my links and don't forget to check out my Patreon because you will get this entire project file for you to do with whatever you want. But for everyone who's watching, if you don't want to support the channel, you will still be able to grab the finished track below. There will be a link in the description. So thank you so much for watching this far and I hope you enjoy the rest of this video. Thank you.
My best friend's sister's boyfriend's... Adams? Here. Adam Lee? Here. Adamowski. Adams. Here. Adler. Here. Anderson. Anderson. Here. Bueller. Bueller. Adams. Here. Adam Lee. Here. Adamowski. Adamson. Here. Adler. Here. Anderson. Anderson. Here. Bueller. 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 Um, he's sick. My best friend's sister's boyfriend's brother's girlfriend heard he was driving as his kid is going to the car to stop past cats out of their mouth. Thank you. 
Thank you.